So how many grooves do you suppose there are on the average 33 and a third RPM record? Stick around and you'll find out. Welcome to Hack a Week. Well, we left off last week with needing the tubes to arrive along with the cartridge and, well, today everything is here. I got the tubes in today, the cartridge came over the weekend, and what I want to do now is give you a before and after sound demo of uh, just what difference this is going to make. I hope quite a bit. I've got an older uh, record here, a vintage one from probably about the time that this was put together, and I don't think I'll be infringing on anybody's copyrights. This is probably in the public domain by now. It's the last of the Red Hot Cha-Cha's. Take a closer look at this uh, album here. It's in really good shape, too. This, this record is pretty scratch-free, and it's older vinyl. Um, well, let's just put it on there and see what we've got. Alright, well that's probably enough for some comparison. Let's get the new tubes and the new cartridge in and give it another try. First thing we'll do is replace the cartridge. Now this is a three wire output on this cartridge. The one I've got is four wires, but the grounds can just be tied out. So we'll do that over on the workbench. There's a couple of screws that hold this whole assembly in. Take those out, and then we will disconnect the wires. There's a white wire, that's the left channel, the black wire is the ground, and the red wire is the right channel. So there's the old cartridge. Now let's go over to the bench, and we'll uh, have to tie out the uh, two ground leads on the new cartridge so that it's basically a three-wire cartridge at that point. I've got the cartridge uh, clamped up in a third hand tool here. These are the four leads on the end. There's a right and left. The inner two are negative, the outer ones are positive. And I'm just going to take an old piece of uh, lead from a LED, put a little bend in it on the end, and then I'll just solder it in place here across these negative leads. that. One more thing about this cartridge I noticed uh, it's not really specced out for this turntable. This is a voice of music turntable I found out from a viewer. Uh, that was pretty cool information they gave me. I've had to bevel the edges right here just a little and get rid of these corners to get it to fit into this tone arm. So hopefully I've got it filed down enough that it'll go in there now so I'll go give it a try and we'll find out. Well I managed to squeeze it in there just barely but it does fit and we've got a brand new needle and cartridge in there now. So let's hear what just the new cartridge sounds like before we put in the tubes. Okay, one more time. New needle and cartridge, same track, same volume settings. I can already tell the mid-range and bass is a lot better. It's just a lot cleaner sound. Richer. Alright, I've replaced the two 6B Q5s and the 12AX7. Let's hear how it sounds. It's a little better, 
I suppose, in the bass. But you know, I'm still noticing the right channel seems to be a lot louder than the left. And playing around with the balance control really doesn't make much difference with that. That left channel should be a little louder. I think it might be time to just pull this whole thing out of the chassis and take a look at uh, what's going on underneath there. Maybe test out a few capacitors. Right then, removal of the amplifier chassis. There's only, let's see, two plugs, a power cord, and the speaker leads. The speaker leads and the two plugs need to be disconnected. There's a little anchor back here for the power cord. I'll pull that off. And of course, some knobs on the top. Four quarter inch head screws on the sides. Uh, the unit is indeed, make sure, unplugged. Let's get to work. One more down here. Got left in. And it should come out now. There it is. Happy little amplifier. Let's get it up on the bench. Okay, let's take a look at what we got here. Probably should get these tubes out of here so when I flip it over I don't damage anything. So that's first up. Okay, let's see what's on the underside. Wow, lots of paper wound paper sealed caps. Oh, I love that smell. Old electronic smell. <laughs> Yummy. It's my favorite. All right, let's get the meter set up here for measuring capacitance. I got a ground connection hooked up. And let's hook it up to the positive side. That's supposed to be measuring 40 microfarads and it's, it's, it's measuring nothing. Here is another 40 microfarad cap. I've got the ground side connected. Let's connect up the positive side and see what we get on the meter. It's not really even wanting to charge up. Hmm. Double check all the connections, make sure I've got a really solid. There's a lot of wax on all these. Uh, solder joints because the capacitors have gotten warm over the years and the wax all ran downhill and dripped on some things so hmm, that's pretty much done too I think and here's another questionable cap this should be 0.47 and I'm getting a reading of 1.4 odd I've got the one I just measured connected to the old uh, night kit capacitor checker. It shows okay, but you know what? I'm really beginning to doubt if this is really working the way it ought to because it's either looking for an open or a short. I don't know if it's actually really testing the cap the way it should, and it's old. So I'm not going to trust that, and I'm thinking what I'm going to do here is just replace every friggin' paper-wound capacitor in here because I think they're all just dried out. They are... 54 years old after all and uh, it's obvious in the chassis here that they've gotten warm over the years lots of the wax is down here in the bottom so I'm just gonna write down all the values get me a list together and uh, go shopping order them all up and when they get here we'll solder them all in looks like this is gonna have three parts to this video well you know I'd like to explain a little bit about uh, vinyl and phonographs and needles and cartridges and how all that stuff works for those of you who were born into the age of CDs and don't know much about vinyl because it's pretty fascinating. So how do we get from the grooves on a record to sound on your speakers? Well, the grooves in the record are basically a representation of the vibration of sound when the music was recorded. 
and then that vibration is transmitted through a little device that actually etches a groove into a master disc. There's a whole lot more involved with just that because you have to consider that base waveforms take up a lot more room and the highs can only go so much because as the record spins the needle can only track a certain amount back and forth physically. So there's a lot with, to do with that. It's called the RIAA curve, the Recording Industry Association of America. And if you Google that, you'll find out a whole bunch more about the RIAA curve and what it all means. What we're going to talk about here is how a needle makes the sound to come out of a record. So the needle tracks in a groove. And here's a picture of a record groove and a picture of a needle in a record groove. So as you can see, the needle tracks back and forth in that groove. This is a really simplified drawing of what's going on with a cartridge. This is the cartridge. This one would be like a ceramic cartridge. Each one of these elements will output a voltage if it's vibrated. So what's going on here is the needle is wiggling back and forth in the groove and one channel goes up through one side, the other channel goes up through the other side and it's at a 45 degree angle. So that's how you can have a right channel on one side of the groove and a left channel on the other side of the groove. And then this is connected to a stereo amplifier and you get the left and right channels. So that's pretty much how it works. And there's some really strange things that go on on a record. And when you're on the outside of the record, obviously when it's spinning at 33 and a third RPM, it has a lot more time out here to actually uh, get all that information squeezed in on a groove. So you have better fidelity on the outside of a record. As it gets closer and closer to the middle of the record, you're crushing down all of that waveform into a smaller space because there's less distance from point A to point B around the record. So uh, a lot of engineers will mix the things that have really loud bass transitions or very high highs out toward the outer tracks and leave the softer passages and quieter tracks toward the inside. Now this record doesn't go too far to the inside in the grooves. You can see it ends with quite a gap before the label. Uh, you can try to cram a lot of information on, but if you do that toward the inside, the fidelity does indeed suffer. So getting back to that question at the beginning of the video, anybody want to venture a guess how many grooves there are on the average 33 and a third RPM record? Well, the answer may surprise you. There's only two, one on each side, because it's a spiral groove that goes all the way to the middle. How about that? I actually do have a record that has two grooves on one side. It's a Monty Python album from back in the 70s, and they did that just to mess with your head, because they were really good at that. There's actually two different tracks on there, and the first time I listened to it, I heard one track, I put it on again a day later, and I heard another track. Pretty strange stuff. They love to have fun with things like that. Well, that's about it for this week. I've got the capacitors ordered from Allied Electronics. They actually had the stuff I needed. It's really hard to find those axial uh, capacitors these days because everything is surface mount. So some of that older stuff is getting few and far between. If you visit the Hack -a Week page for this project, I'll have some links posted there where you can buy these older electronic components. There's quite a few uh, websites out there for people that still cater to that. There's a couple of really neat old tube radio repair sites that will teach you the basics of how to repair old tube radios. And as always, I do lots of internet research before I do these videos, and you can too. So if you're interested in more, just Google away and go searching around and you will learn a whole bunch. So uh, don't think I'll have the capacitors by next week. So we might get on that CB750 um, and maybe do a little bit of work on that. If the garage is warm enough, I sure hope so because a lot of people want to see me get to work on that motorcycle. It's been fun in here in the shop though where it's nice and warm. So that's about it for this week. So till next time. Anyway, that's about it. Till this week. Till this week. I'm just going to go with the first take. <laughs>